Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from New York Community Bank, Capital One Bank, Eastern Consolidated, MNT Bank, Sterling National Bank, Meridian Capital Group, Customers Bank, Aerial Property Advisors, Perfect Building Maintenance. Additional funding has been provided by AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Amtrust Title Insurance Company, AVR Realty Company, Avison Young, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Laumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Mortgage Lending, Citizens Bank, Cohen Equities, Colliers International, NYC, Collins Building Services, Connect One Bank, CPEX Real Estate Services, Dime Community Bank, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Genova Burns, Hendro Properties, Handler Real Estate Organization, HAP Investments, Hodges Ward Elliott Inc., Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Madison Realty Capital, Matone Group, Mercantile Bank, New Banks, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., Peoples United Bank, Polsonelli, Rosewood Realty Services, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, The Knackle Group at Cushman and Wakefield, Maringoff Family Foundation, The Moynian Group, and these friends. They're the counselors to the, to the real estate business. They're the advisors. They're the ones who are helping these owners and landlords and borrowers and developers put money out and do other things. So today I've assembled the gurus of the business to provide the Legal Eagles view of the market today. My guests include Jeff Lenobel, who is the chair of the real estate practice at Schulte, Roth & Zabel, Jay Neveloff, who's the chair of the real estate practice at Crame 11. And last but not least, the kid on the show, my buddy Brian Cohn, who's the director of Gustin and Stewart's. So since you're the kid, okay, and you did something a little different, you, you left the practice of law to go into corporate, and now you're back into law, how do you see the market today? Where are the opportunities? What's going on? Well, I, I've seen a lot of uh, transactions today which are primarily finding complicated situations and working them out, whether it be a complicated partnership where being the solution to a dispute results in being able to control the land, or a situation where there's a landowner and if you're a developer you can add both experience, credit enhancement and value in helping that landowner develop through a joint venture. So here's the question, since you're younger than the three of us over here, and you have some young clients, what's the biggest problem that you would say for a young owner, real estate developer is today? What are the challenges of being in the real estate business? Well, the challenge tends to be access to capital and access to debt. I think more access to debt because you need to have a long-term relationship with a lender, particularly a construction lender. So for example, if for younger, younger people who are part of a larger organization that's maybe been around for multiple generations, that organization would have a long-term relationship with uh, a lot of the local banks that are uh, comfortable lending on construction. Whereas some of the new, uh, uh, the new folks in the marketplace they have to develop their relationships with these banks and these private equity providers from scratch. But the great thing is, is that if you can show a series of successes early in your career, coupled with 
showing that you're transparent and thoughtful and also know how to drive a transaction to a close, you can quickly earn the respect and the trust of a lender, a private equity provider. And so you're seeing a lot of very successful young people, when I mean young, I mean in their 30s or early 40s, who are doing tremendous things right now because they have gained the respect and the trust of the development in the private equity community. S since I have viewers from over 150 countries on, the, on my app and the other situation, would you explain what a private equity firm does in real estate, both for equity and debt? And what is a private equity firm? Well, a private equity fund is a fund that has, has raised money, some of it's institutional, some of it's from family offices, um, some of it is through aggregators, and they're um, investing in a wide variety of things, and a portion of it is allocated to real estate. And they tend to be a significant source and a growing source of, of, of money, whether the money comes in as debt, uh, as preferred equity, as equity, as, as mezzanine debt. It really depends on the situation, depends on the facts, depends on what kind of yield the fund is looking for. But it, it's been... Uh, had a large impact on the market. I think it's going to have a larger impact on the market. They're not um, regulated like banks are. Um, they don't have the oversight that banks and financial institutions have. Uh, they have more latitude. Uh, they may be more entrepreneurial. And I think it's a, in this market in particular, I think it's going to be a, a continuing and growing source of, of money. We were talking in the green room before about this perception of private equity firms, okay? You know, what, there was a perception that, I hate to say, that many private equity firms were like vultures well, in, in the past. Has the perception changed? How do you see that? Clearly, Michael, in the old days, these, these private equity firms existed, but they were called opportunity funds, they were called vulture funds, and they were there as almost hard money lenders. Things have changed because the entire real estate landscape have changed in the past two decades, especially. Uh, there, the banks aren't as visible as they used to be. The institutional lenders aren't as visible as they used to be. I think Dodd Frank has had a real issue. Has had issues with the, the banks have had issues with Dodd Frank and the regulatory complex that sort of surrounds the institutions now. So who filled the void? It was private equity. And people used to be afraid of private equity because they were afraid that they would take your guts out from under you. That's not the case anymore. Private equity is smart. And what private equity does that the institutions don't do now is add value to a project. They, they create value. They invest money. They take higher risk. They want higher returns. So I, I really think private equity has really filled a void. People shouldn't be afraid of private equity, and private equity is here to stay. There are more funds being raised today than I think there ever were uh, on the real estate side because private equity has taken over both the equity and debt sides of real estate. You know, if you read the rags and if you see what's happening, it's been written that a number of uh, uh, established real estate families have not been able to find the right type of transactions or are they looking for other things? How do you see family offices or you know, families of major owners getting involved today in the, in, in the debt and equity business? Well, there, there are a few ways. I mean, they're, they understand the, the fundamentals of real estate. They understand uh, the, um, the structure. But the other thing is that I found with a lot of these multi-generational families in New York, is they've developed a uh, reputation uh, to be a source for both the brokerage community and the development community to constantly bring opportunity. So they're seeing a lot of opportunity. So what they're doing is they're saying, okay, well, maybe it doesn't make sense for us to be in the equity on this, but we can actually make a loan and maybe or participate in a loan from a, uh, uh, from a lender. And so they're participating, they're both making uh, construction or other sort of transitional finance, or they're participating uh, with either direct equity investment or my, more likely more active preferred equity investment. Are you seeing that, Jay? I, I, I am. I think what, what these family offices really have, what these families that have been in, in the real estate business for a long time, they clearly have expertise. They clearly have some money. They clearly have connections and know how deals are done. They're going to add value wherever they are in the stack. 
And I could see situations where uh, these families or, or ongoing businesses are a part of a lending platform or they're brought in um, um, into the equity on new deals for their expertise, for their, their talent and their experience. What I also expect we'll see as we're getting into some situations that are being recapped, um, lenders are going to want to see uh, lenders may be tired of, of, of their existing borrowers. They may be unhappy. They may feel they need some. Uh, I don't want to use the phrase gray hair, especially in this, in this, in this group. Uh, he doesn't have any. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think we'll start to see lenders being happy that a, a fa an, an old line developer, a family developer, is being brought into the deal. I you know, re relating to that, a couple of weeks ago I, I did a show and I had lenders on the show, and I, I, I threw the question out, how do you, what happens when a, a young developer or borrower comes to you? What, what will you do? Because they say we're all sponsor-driven, and two of the lenders said, uh, we don't do business with them. We need them to bring in somebody who's going to vouch for them, who's going to be part of the stack that we feel better. It's the same as raising money. Mm -hmm. Without a track record, it gets very, it's very difficult to raise money today, in any, even in the private equity and the debt fund structures. Uh, but even for young developers today, without a track record, it's very hard. But when, okay, when we're talking about raising money, and we were talking about this in the green room, who wants to take the question about what we call Israeli bond financing, which became pretty big and it's, becoming, it's coming back again? Jeff, Jay? Sure, I'll take the question. It's a tough, it's a tough haul. We've had a few clients who have been involved in Israeli bonds. Some of, most of them have been unsuccessful, but those who are successful uh, can repeat selling bonds in Israel to fund their projects. Um, it's mostly a piece of the equity that they're selling. It's not debt. Uh, we tried to do a debt offering of Israeli bonds and it got pretty far along, but the Israeli bond market didn't really accept debt as collateral. The collateral issue was a problem. So they like equity as well. So they like equity. Um, and if you, can, if you have the right type of product and the deals are relatively small, uh, you can really package these deals and, and it's a source of financing. No, I, I agree with that. I think Jeff's right. Um, what we've seen is that the Israeli bond market was, was really hot two years ago. Correct. It was like really hot. I th I'm told that it's still relatively active if you've got a track record and have done it before. People are able to raise money. Um, it's it's midterm money. It's it's three-year money, four-year money. Have, have any um, of your clients taken advantage of yes. it? Yes. Yes. Another, another topic that you know we're, we're talking about before is the topic of uh, EB-5s. There's mixed opinion on the EB-5s because that uh, foreign investor basically bought a green card for half a million dollars or a million dollars. But as Jeff was saying before, some of the major projects in New York City like Hudson Yards wouldn't have been done or the Barclays Center without EB-5s. I think that you, you have a lot of projects that have been uh, have utilized EB-5 and significant amounts of EB-5. Uh, putting aside the political overtones of whether the program is a good program or not good from a from a political point of view, it's been a source of a lot of financings um, and therefore has, at, at a low cost, has helped a, spur a lot of development. And um, it, it, it's, it's done what it was advertised to do. It was on the books for a very long time before people started taking advantage of it. Right, it's been around it. since It's been the around 80s. forever, right. but people started taking advantage of it, and it was, a, it was a great program, and it financed a lot of large projects, and a lot of people took advantage of it. So it's another source of capital, and it worked. Again, I agree with Jay. We're not here to, to really discuss the political the merits, implications right. of, of, of EB-5 financing, but so long as the program remains viable, people are going to take advantage of it. There's some question of how long it's going to remain viable, but that's really the you know, But at the end of the day, quiet, patient capital from a family office or from a real estate family that brings both patience, perhaps expertise, and uh, a sort of a platform for future deals, for not just one-off deal, but for multiple deals, is the best capital of all, quiet patient capital. And the reason I bring that up 
is that I'm finding more and more that there are family offices, and what I mean by that is wealthy families where their money's been derived from something other than real estate, <clears throat> and they're looking to expand beyond whatever equities or other things that they're investing in. And with, if, you, if you bring in the right uh, counselors and the right advisors, they can plug into real estate and make, uh, make long-term, patient, and thoughtful investments in either uh, cash flowing or real estate development assets. We were, you know, Jeff? I haven't seen a large deal take place where the capital coming into the deal is quiet and patient. Um, I just don't think that exists today anymore. And, um, well, the, the, so the, the challenge I have, and you brought this up earlier when you were talking about private equity, is the seven year and we're out, or the five year and we're out. That's the, That's the challenge. Yes, yeah, so if you've seen private equity now going a little longer, uh, extending the investment period and extending the hold period, and so I, mean, I think the, the investors have to realize that you want to be able to sell your assets at the right time, not get stuck with a hold period of seven years. Well, well, I, I think what you raise is something that is a limiting factor to pri some of the private equity money. Absolutely. Uh, a lot of people don't want to bring in a partner, for example, that's a private equity firm as a way of recapping their deal because they don't want to be faced with whether it's seven years or eight years or ten years having to sell. Uh, I don't think that um, you, the point that you made about family money, I don't think that and EB-5 are mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. I think... They're all different parts of the stack, and, and what I'm seeing in the market and in every transaction, and, and I, I suspect both of you are also, is that everything's more complex. That, that every deal, and, and every year I know I say this, but every year the deal has more here. It has more complexities. It has more, whether it's, it's, it's tranches uh, of debt, whether it's tranches of pref equity, wh whatever it is, everything's becoming more complex more difficult, slower to do. Um, I think people are a little more skittish, and that's why deals are taking longer. I think credit officers at bank are looking at where we are in the curve of the current cycle, where and how this loan they make is going to influence them in the future. Uh, I think you're seeing so much uncertainty now and so much complexity that everything's taking longer to get done. Right. You know, but the deals that, that, that get done that we can facilitate from term sheet stage to funding and closing... I'm finding more often are those where the parties that are acting can be flexible. And to the extent that they can be flexible, whether it's during the transaction or to be able to um, address one of the more important fundamentals of real estate, which is timing, uh, those deals get done and those deals tend to have the, um, the components that will be successful in the future. And that's why I'll go back to the statement that private equity is such a good source of capital because they are flexible, they do understand, they're willing to take some risk, and they're willing to put in some capital. So, so here's the question. That's private equity. We, you know, you pick up the newspaper, and Jay was involved with the sale of the, of the Waldorf Astoria to, to Ambank. You see the Chinese, you see the Israeli, you see the sovereign wealth funds. How is it for the investor or the partner to be dealing with the sovereign wealth fund or an Asian investor or uh, an Israeli investor? How is it? I, I think you can't make a generalization. Um, there are some uh, foreign investors and in sovereign wealth funds that are, are, are very anal, very careful, very deliberate. I, I think there are private equity funds that are, are the same way. Um, so I don't think you can make that generalization. I, I think that um, the, these operating agreements, the joint venture agreements, is, is where the action is. It's, it's, where, it's where the control is. It's where the economics are. And no matter where the financial partner is coming from, you're going to have the same issues. And uh, we see them all the What's time. What's an interesting phenomenon, at one time the private equity firms were literally the private equity firms, but now they're public publicly held companies. Some of them. But they're active players, okay? Apollo Real Estate Advisors, okay, you know. Uh, Blackstone. Uh, Blackstone, all of these people. You're representing a, a real estate owner, okay? How is it to deal with now a public company, which is different because there's different reporting requirements in a private equity firm? I don't think it affects the owner a whole lot at all. Um, 
we were just involved in a large construction loan where one of the private equity debt funds was a, uh, was a, was a lender and the deal would not have gotten done if they weren't flexible, mm -hmm. like Brian, Brian indicated, if they weren't able to understand some complicated issues. And Jay's right also, every deal is so complex today that without, without their understanding, deals would not get done. You know, many people always say to me, you know, where's the best opportunity? I mean, if somebody says to you, you know, I bought this property, should I, I, should I convert it to residential rental or should I make it a condominium? Or, you know, uh, should I repurpose the, the fact because of what's happening in the bricks and mortar and retail? Or I have a warehouse and I'm thinking of converting it to an office. I mean, where do you see the opportunities today? Where, where, where are the real estate opportunities in the metropolitan area? Jay? Well, listen, if you, if you want to talk geographically, um, I'd first say, and it, and it almost, it's the same recurring theme, everything's more sophisticated. Everything is really property specific and lo really specific location specific. And that's what determines it. If you're asking me as a generalization, um, I think Long Island City has lots of opportunities and, and we're seeing an immense amount of growth there. It has the, the public transportation, um, it has the, um, the, the proximity to Manhattan, uh, and, and there are new neighborhoods coming up. I happen to think Williamsburg is very expensive right now. Um, and also I, you don't have the L train. It's going to be out for a year and a half. Well, that's true also. Um, so I think you really have to look at, at the site, at the general area, at the market. Um, people used to say uh, the cost of construction is too high to build a rental. Well, that's changed a little bit because the cost of land has come down and the cost of development rights has come down. I did a show uh, a couple weeks ago on the subject in New Jersey and the, the developers, the owners, and the banker on the show all emphasize transit-oriented development. Anything that's close to transit orientation, okay? Uh, and in, in, in a week or two, I'm going to be doing a show on ferries uh, and light rails, okay? I think that's an, uh, an opportunity because, as you just said about Long Island City, that's why people are going there. The, the negative of Long Island City today, even though I have some very good friends who have property there, is that they haven't been able to create the infrastructure for retail, right. okay, uh, and community. Okay. But I would agree with you, I mean, and Jay. Long Island City is an example of great transportation. Uh, other places in this metropolitan area, uh, we were talking to some folks the other day about uh, Montclair, New Jersey, and other spots in New Jersey. We're working on a project in New Rochelle right now. We closed a deal for one of our clients up in Stamford, Connecticut. These places have a, um, a lot of opportunity because there's a tremendous amount of desire for uh, increase in tax base. I mean, you, you go to New Rochelle or you, you go to Yonkers where RxR is doing a major deal, the, the cost of the commute to the city is 26 minutes. You know, you're in a different situation, okay? And there's a differential in price. So, you know, it's a pricing situation over there. If you talk about markets, though, too, suburban office markets are dying, uh, especially vintage properties. They're just, nobody's lending, nobody's doing anything. But, that's, but that's why they're being repurposed in many cases. Some of them are being knocked down, some of them are being... Sometimes, a lot of them are sitting idle. Yeah. Listen, you're going to have the same thing with some of these regional shopping centers. That's, I, wanted, I was going to bring it up. I mean, look, what, you know, I, I know you've been involved in the, in, the, in the Albertsons deal a number of years ago, which is a supermarket, which is fine. But now we're talking about e-commerce is having a major effects on bricks and mortar retail. Uh, I recently did a report for 1010 Wins talking about Target changing the size of their stores, you know, to 28,000 to 36,000. It's, it's a real problem. If you're not anchored by a grocery store or a drugstore, I think retail is going to suffer. Right. You had uh, an announcement from Sears just in the past day or two um, that... I don't remember exactly what the announcement was. Basically, but they, 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 they may be going out of business. Shutting down, right? right. They may be shutting down. Yeah, but I think, I think the opportunity is where you can be creative. So uh, in suburban office that happens to be located uh, very uh, close to transportation or even large big box suburban retail that could be repurposed into multi-use, uh, there's going to be so many opportunity to invest because the cost of land is so low that 
with creativity and with the sort of desire of people to get out of their cars and to be able to walk to the train to get to work and when they get home to be able to walk to whatever their entertainment or to, to, to dinner, to their restaurants. Uh, what's, what's but that's exciting. part of the transit oriented. Well, and it's exciting. I think there's a flock nationwide to urban centers. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's indicative of mass transit I, and transportation so, hubs. Since I have three, including myself, uh, baby boomers on here, I think one of the areas which is really growing in the metropolitan area, especially in New York City, even though it's expensive, is the assisted living. The assisted living market, you know, with the two planned right now, one on 56th Street, and Lexington Avenue, the other one on 95th Street and 2nd Avenue, people don't want to move to Florida, except for my friend Jeff. Okay, you know, uh, but... Well, three of us maybe start thinking about assisted living in the near future, uh, but um, you see that everywhere, and you see that nationwide. Assisted living is such a growing, uh, it's such a growing part of the real estate industry right now. Uh, or I, health I, I actually question that, because I remember so many times over over the past two or three dec two decades, people looking at the demographics and planning for no, the No, you're not talking about but assisted it, living. You're talking no, 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 no. I'm talking you're, really about CCRC. Right, right. Correct. you're talking CCRC, and you're also talking active adult <laughs> communities, okay? The active adult communities that were created 25 years ago, today are <laughs> assisted, assisted living. Oh, okay, they became assisted living, so it's, it's, it's a different There are world. some great operators out there, like Atria and others, uh, where developers and uh, property owners are looking to these folks to take their property, whether it's located in the city or in these uh, near-lying areas, I, I mean, instead of having folks move out of the area, they get to put their car look, away, uh, the, and they can the, get the into the city. Esplanade, which everything. is on the west side, right. which has been in assisted living for years, has recently been acquired by a new organization, uh, Bristol and in partners, and they're going to make it a quality assisted living. They're recuperating. I think thing. it's great. So I think it's going to see more and more of that. So I think in summation, you'd say the world is okay, but there are some difficulties in, in each and every transaction. I think the real estate landscape has changed, but I think we're all adapting to its changes. And I think as long as uh, the real estate leaders have the right type of counsel, the world will be okay. And the deals that take so long to close, it's never our fault. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I'd like to thank Jeff, Jay, and Brian, and I'll see you next week.